Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. It's David Dubow, and today my guest is the distinguished pianist George Shandor. Born in Budapest, Shandor has played the world over. He has taught very many important pianists, and he continues to perform music everywhere. He has written a book, which was published about a year ago, on piano playing, which every piano student should own. I think, George, it's published by Shermer Books. Am I correct? That's correct, David, yes. How are you, George? <clears throat> Fine, thank you. Good to be here with you. Tell the audience what we will be discussing today, because it's a new composer for most of us. We're going to hear a taste of this composer, as well as hearing some foray songs and Kodai songs by Mrs. Kodai. And who is Andras Sulushi? Well, I can tell you not very much about Andras Sulushi, the person, only about the composer, maybe. I was in Budapest about a month and a half ago. I was invited to perform two of Bartok's concertos, number two and three. And uh, I had a very enjoyable and warm reception. And the last day I was there, I was taken out for dinner by a friend of mine, Mr. Karpati, who wrote a very fine book on Bartok's string quartets, and by Mr. Sulushi, whom I never met before. And we had a very enjoyable time. Mr. Sulushi is a very... Uh, pleasant, uh, rather uh, gentle kind of a fellow. We talked about music and we agreed on all kinds of things. We talked about composition and all that. And bef when I left, he gave me a recording of it very quietly and shyly. He says, why didn't you listen to this music? So I got back to New York a few days later, and to my great surprise, I heard one of the finest music I have ever heard, especially I mean, in this last few dozens of years. Well, I saw you on the street and you said to me, David, you know, I have just come across a composer while I was in Hungary. I met him. I don't know anything about him, but you were, you were so impressed. I said, well, I have to hear some of it and perhaps you could come on this program and we could uh, listen to uh, perhaps the Bartok Third, which you just played a little bit of it. And, and uh, you had uh, said that you uh, um, saw a uh, Mrs. Kodai and had a tape. I said, I'd like to hear her sing, and she's a lovely, lovely uh, artist. And then we started listening to tidbits of this music, and indeed, it is phenomenal. And one of the things I want to discuss with you is that for a long time, you have been telling me that you felt music in so many ways had hit a dead end. Am I right? Well, I must agree with this last statement. Maybe it's not a dead end, but it's half a sleep end. Uh -huh. Because of course, in the, my past years, I have premiered and looked always for a lot of mo contemporary music, and I still do the same thing. <clears throat> but my impression was, excuse me, that in the last uh, few dozens of years, music did actually come to a halt. There were too many arbitrary theories being ex experimented with, too many new sonorities, too many new instruments, and everybody tried to be new, and very few people tried to be really good. Uh -huh. Including think, electronic means. Yes, I mean, the, uh, electronics is very interesting as, a, uh, as an experiment for n new sounds, new sonorities. But music somehow has one direction. Way back, we can go back to folklore and go through Palestrina and Beethoven, Bartok and Prokofiev. The music goes ahead. There's an awful lot of modern music being written today like there always was. There were always a lot of people who experimented with things. But I felt that somehow we got stuck with... Uh, experiments in sonority and uh, little tidbits of musical elements which of course are necessary in music have been explored tremendously but the fundamental musical uh, melodic and harmonic material was not quite well explored yes now after this dodecaphonist experience which maybe there are there are some people who still believe in it and follow it and you're speaking of the the music of schoenberg weber and in his school right yes about that school which, which invented the word 12 tone instead of 12 notes yes because we always had 12 notes since bach anyway the mm -hmm. chromatic scale and there was this arbitrary structure of certain um, tone rows which which should be put together in a way that nobody else done it before they were mostly interesting ex experiments in, in logic mm -hmm. and in sound, but there was not much coherent music or evolutionary music written. So I was looking for the kind of so-called new music 
where the same laws of evolution, evolvement of sounds and emotions and feelings come about in a convincing way. So I found this man's music, Andras Solution music, it is not atonal, it's not strictly tonal either. The music to me sounds very organic, and very expressive, and quite uh, obviously we respond to the music the way the composer wants us to respond to it. Uh, George, why do you respond to it? Uh, because the, the amount I heard, one can't label it very easily and say that this is easily accessible, nor can one say that it's merely neo-romantic, which many composers are trying to be again. It seems to be very original. It is very original. I think he uses very conventional instrumentation, mm -hmm. or regular symphony, but he writes very little for piano, if at all. I, I feel a very healthy and very beautiful motivic evolvement, development in his music. He tackles very tiny little seg bits of sounds, and he de develops them in a orchestral or counterpuntal way, coloristically, that's very interesting, and somehow one feels the same, uh, one has the same response to this kind of music as one, when one listens to Brahms or to Bach or to Bartók. An, an emotional was, response. Emotional response is immediate. I yes. mean, that's those very s soft and sort of halting s sonorities, which we we'll hear now, are very explosive ones, are very, very easily understandable. You have always felt that music is very visceral, that it has to be understood emotionally, or that the music is, is too cerebral then to, to be of in importance in the yes. long run. Yeah. I think we do need some intellectual discipline yeah. too. But for, for instance, in this music, there's none of this mechanical symmetry, search for symmetry as we found in the classic yes. period, nor do we find the arbitrary e avoiding of tonal centers. There's a reference to tonal centers. The form is very freely and very clearly understood. Did he talk to you um, about his own work? He never said one word about it. He just said, listen to this music, and I would like, like to hear your opinion. And I just had a letter from him where he uh, tells me about his life. I never knew well, about it. Well, tell his. me, Andras Sulushi, pronounce it Sulushi, properly. Very well pronounced, yes. Okay. So he's one of the many Hungarian composers who are recognized at home, but I don't think he has he's, he's received the recognition that he, he deserves. And people like Bartók and Kodai, and could have were composers out of many other Hungarian composers, but they somehow developed and became the giants of Hungarian music. Mm -hmm. This fellow is amongst many other composers who write music in many different ways, but I think he found, at least for my liking, he certainly found a way to express himself, which is very clear, very new, very understandable, and very convincing. It's very exciting. We're going to, on this program, hear small sections of works. Let's begin with... Um, uh, what shall we hear first, George? Maybe first we should listen to the composition called Sonorita. Son so Sonorita. it's sonorities. And, yeah. and then there's another piece which he calls Lehelet. Actually, that's the pun, because Lehelet means breath in Hungarian. But one of the fine conductors in Hungary is George Lehel, uh -huh. who performed this co composition first. So it's sort of dedicated to him. So what shall we hear first? Maybe Sonorita. So it's it's about a what? How many minutes? Fifteen minutes? Two minutes, about six, seven minutes of sonorita we could listen. We'll hear about six, seven minutes. How interesting that we're going to get to hear this for the first time, really, in America, probably. I know that we have never programmed any sulushi. Let's hear sonorita.
Well, George, we have just heard a um, few minutes of Andras Sulushi's sonorite. Tell me now, uh, again, why, why is this important music? Why is it, has it so captivated you? Well, I just can tell you my own impression. I believe music is many things, but it's not just beautiful melodies. The music is, is life and emotion and development, evolvement. There surely is evolvement in this work, Certainly, right? yes. I mean, there is a, there is a fundamental, a tiny bit of a material there which he manages to develop in a very unmistakable way. Mm -hmm. starts off very quietly. There's no actual symmetry. There's no, no ex excessive structure uh, pushing of the material. It keeps on growing. It's, it's, it's like a little bit amorphous at the beginning, but it's an organic growth and development of st sound and volume. And the climax which he reaches are quite obvious and simple for us to feel and to respond yeah. to. This is a 13-minute work that was composed in 1974, and we heard about four and a half minutes of it. Right after this message, we will come back and we will hear some more, an another taste, George, of this composer, and you pronounce it for us. Andras Solushi. We'll be right back, George. This is David Dubal, and today my guest distinguished pianist George Shandor and we're discussing some new music from Hungary the composer Andras Sulushi. George we heard from his sonorata and we're going to now hear from what? The next piece is called Leherlet which actually the literal translation means breath mm -hmm. like a breath of air. It's also a pun because the book was dedicated to a Hungarian conductor whose name is George Leher. I see. In any case that's a kind of music I think the same style as what we heard before. In other words this is very seminal material, very small scale material which is being developed in a very healthy, unmistakable, very artistic and imaginative way. Yes. Uh, music as an art is um, no doubt not conducive lately for, for uh, great communicative uh, essays, obviously, because since, for instance, your own premiere of the Bartok Third Concerto in 1946. There has not certainly been a piano concerto in the repertory uh, following that. Uh, so compositionally, you have been, so to, so to speak, struggling with the last 30 years. You've been listening closely, and, and you've been disillusioned. And this is, I think, why you're very excited. You hear some possibilities here. Yes, well, I certainly hear something that is alive. I hear something that's new, that's personal. I hear something that evolves out, out of certain substances, something that is experimental in a certain way, but is not, not uh, an obsessively experimental piece. Mm -hmm. I don't hear the cerebral activity, those cerebral activities going on which dodecaphonists use, which actually are very strenuous for the ear and become, after a while, quite monotonous. There's an emotional. Um, activity going on, which is really music in motion and in mm -hmm. evolvement, mm -hmm. which expresses many, many things. There are no lovely themes, mm -hmm. and if I may quote Kodai, when I studied composition with him, he said the most important music is not that you have a pretty melody, but the question is what do you do with the substance you are dealing with? You yes. can take a little fragment, like the beginning of the Fifth Symphony, which is a four-note motif. It's not what, how the theme is, what the theme is like, what do you do with it? Yes. And that's what I was I've tried to find in many composers' music, and it's very hard to find. Yes, it is. Well, you have this pregnant quality in, in Sulushi's music, no doubt about it. Yes, it's certainly music that is starts from a seed, so to say, and evolves in a very unmistakably beautiful way. Tell me again what we're going to hear now for a few minutes. Well, the next piece is Lehel, that you mean? That, that's okay, the piece which fine. Was, uh, uh, presented by George Lehel, the conductor. I see, and it's. I think it was a. Uh, was it a ballet score? Uh, I don't I know. It was an orchestra piece. I really don't know. Yes, the, here it the, was performed by the Budapest Symphony in 1975, and it is dedicated to uh, Lehel, the conductor. That, that's right. Yes. Let's hear it now. <laughs>
Okay, we have just faded out on uh, another uh, Suloshi work, and that one is uh, Lay Alert. Is Lay that Alert, it? yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, that that has a real power, and, and as we were listening to it, you said angular. Um, this is a composer that uh, we have not heard on the station, and uh, let's hope that we have a chance to hear the whole work soon. And this all happened really because very, very... Uh, Easily, he just said, "Oh, here's here's some records of mine." And yeah, that was his music. Well, what impresses me Dave, so much is that his music encompasses really all kind of moods. It's not a certain type of angular or whining or shrieking or whatever which you heard now. But sure. sometimes it's very mellow and very gentle, and very subdued, which I think is, uh, from the point of view of expression, is very important. I mean, the, he tries to express and very successfully the entire range of human emotions. Mm -hmm. It's not cerebral. It's not dramatic all the time, you couldn't put your finger, this is his style, he covers mostly everything. It's not atonal music by any means, and the structure is very clearly understandable. George, why is not contemporary music popular with the public? You know, well, you are making a differentiation and saying, oh yes, it, uh, there's a, um, uh, it's difficult to love uh, atonal music and so forth, but I think that the general public, of course, would have trouble with this too. Absolutely. Well, I think. Why? Why do we have trouble with music that uh, is of our time? Well, God, because uh, we never like anything that's new. But when you listen to music, when you re read a book, you can understand the language. When you listen to music, and the composer is indeed an original innovator and has his own personal style, that means. He produces sounds and sonorities which we never heard before. Yes. They're not copies of Brahms or Bartók. But people no. really resent that in, in our how? time. Yes, and they, we don't even we don't get attuned to it unless we heard the piece many times. So if you listen to a late Beethoven quartet or to Solovich's music, the general public's response will be the same. They don't like it. There's nothing to recognize, nothing to relate to. When you heard a piece of music often enough, when you can respond to it, when you assimilate it, then your emotions respond to the sounds. After all, sounds are what? Sounds are supposed to be either stimulating or depressing, and we have to be able to respond to those sounds. People of now call most of the sounds they hear, uh, if it's Schoenberg's music or if it's here, uh, the music we have just heard by Andras uh, Sulushi, uh, they would still say, well, this is, this is too difficult. I don't have the melody to relate sure. to. I love my Beethoven. Sure, but they, they only love Beethoven Moonlight so They don't like Opus 132, String, string Quartet. So they basically, like then, the public likes, in your opinion, very little music. The great public likes familiar music. When Beethoven became familiar, they loved him. When Bartók became familiar in the last few years, they love him now. So we will have to wait his 30 or 40 years, too. Yes, but as you said, that the, the public still loves only the moonlight compared to, you know, the late string quartets. Much of your life, even though you have played the standard literature, you'll be playing the Brahms D minor next week or whatever, uh, you have played w uh, music of Prokofiev and Bartók and Kodai that uh, certainly has... Um, has not the public acclaim of the Moonlight Sonata. What, no. keeps, what keeps you going at it? Well, I'm a pro, and uh. I know the music, and I heard it many times. The audience that spends about 6 or 8% of its life or time in a concert hall cannot be very well be compared to a musician who spends 95% of his time. So we, we are more familiar with this music. We respond to it. When Wagner wrote Tristan and Isolde, in, and it had its premiere in Munich in 1869 or 59, in 10 years the whole world, though, loved it. Today we don't have that. Well, 10 years is a long time, and not the whole world loved it, David. I think the people who, who were musician, musicianly and who heard it a lot. But the, I don't see there's music by Rachmaninoff or by Brahms that at mm -hmm. first hearing is accessible. But as a rule, a new, a new composer, really valid a composition style, has to be original and different of mm -hmm. the familiar yes. idiom. Now, uh, the works of Schoenberg, for instance, they're not, they're not loved. Do you think perhaps that as you were saying before in this 12-note uh, technique, you think that was a false aesthetic system? Well, I would agree to that. Of course, I don't see that anything we don't like is good. I wouldn't say that. I would say that anything that is good, unless we heard it often enough, we will not like. We yes. might respect or be, be interested or curious about it, but to really respond emotionally to music, that is possible only if the sound structure is familiar to us, our, our nervous system is, is able to respond to it. Yes. And those sounds which sound totally unintelligible for one, after a few hearings, if it's good music, if it's good, music, if it is, yes, if it co corresponds to human nature, human reflexes, mm -hmm. series of human reactions, 
that be, might, will become familiar and we can emotionally respond to it too. And yet you instantly responded to uh, the music we're discovering today, the music of uh, Andras uh, Sulushi. Well, again, I must say I'm a pro, maybe, uh, and I have a lot of music. You hear quicker then. Maybe, maybe quicker. That doesn't mean that I'm infallible, God forbid. Yeah. But I think that one has a cert certain uh, background, a certain education in music. One might respond better to music that suits one's tastes and follows the pattern. Well, part of likes. our part of our program today, George Shandor, is in in tasting, in discovering this new composer. Uh, that you yourself have just uh, discovered, Andras, and now you, Andras Solushi. And we're now going to hear what? A little bit of. Now we might hear something of another piece which is called Transfigurazioni. As you see, the titles are very nondescriptive. Yes. The one is called sonor Sonority, the one is called Music for Orchestra, the one is Transfigurations. It's a, it's a process of varying, of, uh, it's a process of metamorphosis of certain sounds, which usually begin with tiny little bits, elements, and which are evolved. Yes. And that's, by the way, what I object with a lot of contemporary composers, that they s get stuck with those little elements. They present them in many, many kind of uh, variants, but they are not able to develop organically a larger structure. Aha. Uh -huh. And this material. And, this and, is and he can do this, yes. Do, absolutely. He, he's able to do this. Let's hear, the, what is the work's title? A Transfigurazioni. Let's hear some minutes of that We're one. We're going to hear about three, four minutes of okay. that. Okay. George, what have we heard now by uh, Solushi? We heard a fragment of the Transfiguration by Solushi. 
Uh, if you will wait for a second or two, we'll be back with more music on our program right after this message. My guest today, George Shandor. George, we are back, and we have tasted, so to speak, I'll use that word because I think it's a good one, the music of a Hungarian composer was probably about, what, 55 years old? Just about, yes. Uh, living in Budapest now, and his name, Andras Sulushi. And pronounce it one more time correctly okay. before we go on to another subject. Andras Sulushi. I can't get it well, properly. Well, the accent is the first syllable. Uh, I have it's such trouble with, with names. I have trouble with names. George, um, you studied piano with the great Bartok, and you studied composition with Kodai. We're going to hear in this program Mrs. Kodai sing some songs and tell me of your association with Kodai and with uh, Mrs. Kodai. Well, as you said, David, I did study composition with Mr. Kodai. At that time, his first wife was alive, who was an elderly lady, so to say. She was about 21 years senior to Kodai. When she passed away, Kodai was 76 and remarried, a young mm -hmm. lady who was, was about 22 at that time. That was quite many years ago. Could I pass the way in the meantime in, in, in 66, 7, I believe mm -hmm. he died. And this young lady became a mature, wonderful artist. She, she had a very strong, very strict musical training. She, was a very, she had a very fine voice, and now she starts to concertize. I happened to uh, see her in Budapest during this last visit I was there, and she gave me a tape of some foray songs and some of Kodai's music. Mm -hmm. Actually, she's starting to concertize. I will have the opportunity to hear in Assisi. You'll be there this uh, summer. Yes, we have a, there's a music festival there where I perform a few concertos and chamber music works, and she will give a recital there too. And I was really very, very impressed by this lady who, is not, who has not only a lovely voice, but it's one of the purest intonations and musically very, very expressive. So I think we'll enjoy, you, as you did, hearing this uh, music by Foray. George, getting back to Kodai himself, uh, he was a sensational teacher, wasn't he? Well, he was a real master yes. who was, was a very scientific mind, and of course, very imaginative musical temperament. And uh, his composition course was quite a strict one. We had, I majored in composition, it took about five years. We spent about three years doing nothing else but two-part 16th century vocal counterpoint. My goodness. But we went through, of course, all, all the other uh, crafts and skills of composition. He was not as prolific as Bartók, but the music is very valuable, very important music. This no, is the 100th anniversary, I think, of his... Actually, yes. He was born in 1882. It was last uh -huh, year. Yes. So there's more Kodai music being heard. But he's more known now as a, as a developer of a Kodai method, which is yes. used for, be for beginners, mostly. It's even been in a movie. Oh, yes. I think <laughs> it's all over the world. The yes. Kodai centers, all I just came from Colombia and from Mexico, they have Kodai centers there, too. Mm -hmm. So it, it begins to overshadow a little bit his compositional. He was almost like a hero in, in um, Hungary. Well, he actually was a hero. And really? humanly, he was, behaved wonderfully well during the Second World War, now the post-war years, too. And he became very popular just, uh, just before he died. George, of course, you are best known as... Uh, a concert pianist, but it's little known that you have yourself, uh, I don't know if you've composed, but you certainly have transcribed music and, and magnificently. Well, I did some of that, yes. My compositions are worth nothing. And they I are worth nothing, worth why? Nothing because they were nothing else but the pre preparation for understanding and knowing how music comes about. Do, do you think that uh, too many musicians today that are performing don't know enough about how to compose? I must say you're absolutely right, David, because music is not just uh, re repro reproduction process of sounds, we really have to know and feel where music came from, where it goes to, yes. how music is being structured. And I think a study, a, a th thorough, methodical study of composition would be essential to all musicians. Yes. Um, who, what, we're going to hear a couple of uh, foray songs, I believe. What's Mrs. Kodai's first name? Her name is Sharorta, which is a Hungarian form of Sarah. Sarah yes. Pizzeli Kodai. Has she come to the United States yet? She has been here several times, but never as a performer. I think she's coming next fall, and she will. She might have some concerts. I think she did perform in Canada last year and uh, uh, performed at some of the smaller musical communities. But I think she's ready now for a major musical career. Well, let's hear Mrs. Kodai now in two songs, at least for the time being, of Foray. <laughs>
We have just heard Sharata Kodai in three four eight songs. George um, George Chander is my guest. She has quite a lovely voice, and uh, actually we heard that at a disadvantage because that was uh, merely a cassette tape, and it was a live recital. So I hope we hear more of Mrs. Kodai's art in America. Oh, I hope so. Well, this was a studio performance, really. Now tell me about your um, recent appearance in Budapest. Well, it was very enjoyable. I did uh, perform there about two years ago, given Bach, Beethoven, Chopin, Liszt recital. They asked me to come back and do some Bartok's. So I did the Bartok second and third. Of course, the second concerto, I did study with Bartok himself, and I still have in my ears this phenomenal playing I heard by Bartok. The third concerto was close to me too, of course, because I have to give the world premiere of that piece with Orman and Philadelphia Orchestra shortly after Bartok's death. The public was wonderful, and I must say I had a very interesting time with the orchestra because they play these pieces right and left in Hungary. Mm -hmm. But uh, they used uh, the, the edition of the first uh, Buzzi and Hawks edition of the Bartok Third Concerto, which was full of quite a few errors. So we, we cleared those up, and the orchestra was very happy and uh, very cooperative in, in working along. So the con concerto went quite well. Actually, I just received today an invitation, a confirmed invitation, to go back and play the first concerto, which, of course, is one of my favorites. George, why don't you do one, two, and three? I heard you at Carnegie Hall do all three concertos at one, in one night. Well, I'd be delighted to. I would love to do that. That was actually the uh, 25th anniversary of his death when we performed that with Gregory Miller and the American Symphony Orchestra. And I have done the three concertos together several times since, in Hungary and, and also in Brazil. So I hope I will do that here, oh, too. That's that's, so that's the first phenomenal. concert is the least not very good example of what you said before so the most beautiful compositions but very little heard so the audience does not respond to this they do to the third concert they respond to the third best don't much, they much more so yes the second is is getting to be more and more played though yes it's a real virtuous wonderful piece well you have been the foremost champion of Bartok and you worked with him as a piano student for four years Yes, I was uh, his private student for a year, and I graduated the Liszt Conservatory with him. I'm really not a champion of Bartók. I just play Bartók because I love it, and by now the world begins to realize that it belongs to the three or four Bs, one yes. of some of the greatest composers. There will be a four Bs one of these day, uh, days, won't there? I mean, it's not three anymore. Not anymore. I think he joined the club. Mm -hmm. That's quite a club. Um, when you did it with Ormandy in 46, Bartok was now dead a year or so. Well, he was he dead already. He died in 1945, uh, September. Yes. And actually, I was uh, with him till the very, very last days of his, very last hours of his life. He never mentioned to me the third concerto. He wrote that piece for his wife, for Dita oh. Pastor, by the way, just passed away. Oh. And shortly after Bartok's death, death <coughs> so Steve O'Shelley got in touch with me in December 1945, telling me about this concert, which I didn't know a thing about. Really? And then uh, we, through Goddard Lieberson, we got in touch with Ormandi, who set a date for January 26th, I believe. That's when we gave the world premiere of it. And curiously enough, Mr. Thompson, Virgil Thompson, who's yes. a very wonderful musician and composer, he was a music critic at that time, and he said that the concerto was very well received, it was very well played, and we have a composition here which will probably last two or three seasons. Uh -huh. So we all did that. Well, I know Virgil Thompson very well, and he certainly is perceptive, but indeed he made a mistake on Understand that concerto. Understatement, yes. Yeah. Well, it must have been some thrill for you to have encountered the third concerto, let alone give it the world premiere. Well, I was certainly delighted to do it. And we uh, did a great deal since. Well, it's one of the most popular works now all over the world. George Chandor is my guest today. <clears throat> and, George, uh, we were just speaking of the fact that uh, w the world will have to start realizing there's four Bs, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, and Bartok. You were just in Mexico where there was a, uh, a square. Oh, yes. That was a very beautiful, very touching ceremony I attended now. The city of Mexico dedicated one of the beautiful squares in the Colonia to Cuauhtémoc, it's called, and named it after Bartók. There was a bust of Bartók. At the same time, they also named one of the fairly wide and, and important streets after Kodai. So just a few days ago, these two people became very, very solidly commemorated in Mexico, and I just hope that the rest of the hemisphere will do the same thing. Well, it's fitting that you were there at the ceremonies. Um, how about hearing at least one movement, the third, of the Bartok Third Concerto 
in your performance. Not your performance uh, on Columbia with Ormandy, but uh, with Michael Gillan. Gillan, yes. Yes, and the Pro Musica Orchestra of Vienna. Let's hear the third movement of the Bartok Third with my guest, George Shandor, as piano soloist.
you have just heard that giant technique of George Schondorf's in the last movement of the Bartok Third Piano Concerto for Music Orchestra Vienna, conducted by Michael Gielen. And George, we have no more time. Always delightful to talk to you. Well, thank you, Dave. We I'm actually, happy to be here. I'm happy to have, be able to present Mr. Sulushi and Mrs. Kodai and Bartok. You be well and have a good time this summer. I know you'll be playing um, a lot of Brahms. Well, it's Brahms year. We have a good excuse. I will do the Brahms first concerto. Wonderful. I'm going to do the Brahms quintet and the Brahms horn trio with uh, Barry Tuckwell and so on and so forth. And that's in Assisi, uh, Italy? Assisi, yes, a beautiful festival there during the month of July. Wonderful. George, have a great time. And this is David Dubal. Thank you for listening. For the Love of Music, with today's host, David Dubal, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company. <laughs>